So just quick disclosures and disclaimers. Um, Melissa and I co-authored a book, which is one of the reasons we're doing this talk, but we are entitled to royalties from that book. Um, we also, I'm a co-inventor and a, an owner of the Selly Coping Company, which has a tool for kids with medical conditions. It's a coping kit for kids and families. Um, so I could also benefit financially from that. I don't think we're going to talk about that much today, um, but I always put that in all my disclosures too. And then just a disclaimer, again, like we're going to talk in generalities about ideas and what things look like, but the talk, um, definitely if you have questions, make sure you ask your, your child's medical team or get specific advice for your specific child. And this brings us to Melissa, she's going to introduce herself and we'll learn a little bit about her and her journey. Hi, yes, I'm Melissa Hogan. And um, I think like everybody on here, we all had a life before we encountered medical conditions in our children or Courageous Parents Network and the need for it. So I started out my adult life as an attorney for healthcare companies, and I taught healthcare regulatory law and legal writing. Uh, but as of course, as life would have it, have it, I had three kids, and I never would have predicted that I'd be sitting here talking about pediatric medical trauma, as I'm sure a lot of you wouldn't have either. But my son was diagnosed, my youngest son, at two, that's case right there, with Hunter syndrome or mucopolysaccharidosis 2, which is a progressive lysosomal storage disorder. Uh, he's currently 16, and so he's the one you may hear in the other room. But he got into a clinical trial at three, and because of everything that was demanded of him and his experiences, he developed really severe medical trauma. And that sent me on a journey um, 10 years before this book would actually come out to look at that and try to help him. Ended up founding a nonprofit project alive and then eventually connecting with Megan to work on this book to try to help families um, have resources that I was searching for desperately at the time. I'm still a practicing attorney. I deal with people with trauma almost every day and uh, keep writing as well. Megan? A little bit about me. I'm a pediatric psychologist by training. I did my undergraduate training up in Ohio at a tiny school called Baldwin Wallace, where I did a neuroscience psychology undergrad degree. And then I popped over to University of Toledo and did a clinical psych degree there. And I spent my early career and finished my training up at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia out east. And I'm now over at University of Kentucky, Kentucky Healthcare, um, trying to champion some mental health efforts um, over at UK. And those are my beautiful boys there down in the pictures. I'm a single mama of two boys and um, got to join this journey with Melissa when she reached out to, you know, cold, cold turkey emailed me and said, hey, what about this? I'm like, all right, let's think about this and let's see what book. we can do together. Yeah, let's write a book together. Um, and of maybe interest, we didn't even meet each other till about last year after working together for three years via online and phone calls and kind of developing this content. And so when we Came together, I've really learned a lot from Melissa's journey. Um, she shared a lot about her own personal experience and her experience with her son. Um, and then I've brought perspectives of families that have taught me, you know, along the way about what this journey has been like for them. So we really, when we talk about mental, medical trauma, we're bringing those two perspectives together. So I think we're going to try to go through this fairly quickly so that we leave some room for questions and, and discussion. Um, I think as we go through this talk, if you really think about your own personal experiences or experiences of other families that you know, that can really help this kind of hit home a little bit and be more interesting as well. I'm going to talk starting off like what is medical trauma or medical traumatic stress? And you know, this is the definition up there, this big kind of fancy long definition, the psychological, physiological responses of kids and families kind of in context of illness or injuries. We know medical tra trauma can affect any person in the family including the child, caregiver, siblings, kind of broadly. I like to describe it as just the emotional reactions to really scary medical stuff. Um, and those emotional reactions can have body reactions too. So not just you know, our emotional feelings, but kind of those reactions to things that are uncomfortable or new or scary. So if you've done any research on this, or if you Google after this, there's a number of different terms that are associated with medical trauma. Um, people call it medical anxiety, medical traumatic stress, post-traumatic stress disorder related to medical conditions, um, post-trauma psychological sequelae. So a lot of this is there's been lots of different kinds of terms over time 
but all of those are really referring to the same kind of concept that we're talking about. So thinking about one of the things that we often hear from families is, you know, they kind of often will feel really isolated or feel alone when they start to feel or have some of these medical traumatic stress symptoms, either in their child or themselves. Um, but it's actually really, really common for families that have kids with medical conditions. Um, some of the research has shown about, you know, 30% or like one in three of kids and their caregivers or parents experience trauma reactions related to medical care kind of in the shorter term. And then for some families that can persist, kind of depending on a number of factors, anywhere from 10 to 75% of children can have, even if a medical condition has kind of finished up and they're in survivorship from something, can have persistent emotional reactions to the experience that they had. And the same for parents and siblings as well. We'll spend a few minutes talking about what does medical traumatic stress look like in kids? Um, one moment, let me just settle down my very excited children over there. So I'll, I'll jump in. Um, you know, I saw a lot of these in my son in terms of he would try to distract himself from what was going on. Um, he would start, you know, the kicking and screaming are the traditional things that we think of, but there can be a lot of other, um, symptoms that may not look like something we go, oh, they're, they're having trauma right now. Um, Megan sees this almost every day at work and she can talk to you from her vast experience seeing families. Thanks, Melissa. Um, see, this is why we make a good team. <laughs> um, so thinking about just kind of four different categories of what these symptoms often look like in kids. Um, so thinking a little bit about you know, changes in just the overall mood. So in the ch children you're working with or in your own child, if you kind of see a shift from a kid who's generally engaged and happy and more joyful, um, and they start getting a lot more worried or more sad or withdrawal, um, we see it especially in teenagers, they'll withdraw and like go up to their room. Sometimes in the hospital settings, we'll see kids like hide under their blankets every time somebody comes in the room um, or things we also see particularly um, in our boys, um, we'll see more irritability or anger. So in our society, that's kind of a way that we've said is socially acceptable for some of those tough feelings to come out. So sometimes we'll see more, sometimes in girls too, but that's a common one that pops out. The re-experiencing is kind of just like what it says is for kids, there might be a particular moment or a particular hard thing. Um, for a lot of kids, things like needle sticks, or if they had to go in and get stuck like four different times or had like a port access that didn't go well, they'll kind of get stuck on that. And you'll see them kind of either talking over and over about it. Sometimes they'll have racing thoughts before they go to bed. For some kids, it might be thinking about the last hospital experience, thinking about how that might happen in the next hospital experience. Sometimes our kids will have bad dreams or nightmares. Um, Sometimes for kids, the nightmares don't even seem like they're related to the medical condition or care, but it's just kind of stimulated those things and those kind of negative feelings at night up for them. Another bucket of symptoms that we have is avoidance. And so if you think about your family, if you have a child that like doesn't want to talk about it, doesn't want to think about it, you know, gets mad if they hear you talking about it, they want nothing to do with it, don't want to talk to the doctors, the nurses or anybody they just want to kind of pretend it's not there. We see that sometimes. For some of our kids, we'll see them refuse treatment. And this can be really tricky to sort out as why is somebody refusing? Is it because they're afraid of a needle? Is it because the medicine makes them feel really sick? I know for some of our patients, like with CF, cystic fibrosis, doing their best treatments, it reminds them that they're, they have CF and they want to just pretend it's not there and just you know be a normal teen or normal kid. And so sometimes having to take the medications or do the treatment reminds them of their diagnosis or their medical conditions. Sometimes if kids like aren't getting ready when they're supposed to, to leave for the hospital or really like kind of dragging them to get in the car, sometimes that can be a sign of avoidance as well. And then the last thing kind of bucket that we look at is that hyperarousal. So kind of being ready for that fight, flight, freeze response. Those are the body's responses we said that we talk about. Melissa mentioned that about case, the kicking and the screaming and the like, really agitated the kids that are fighting things off. Um, sometimes they'll be frozen in the corner and like can't move. Um, so things like that to, to take a look at in um, kids. Melissa, do you wanna talk a little bit about the fight, flight, freeze response? I know that you've had some experiences yourself with this, with this one yeah. that you described. 
Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we went through periods where multiple people had to hold my son down for a needle stick or especially we had a weekly infusion. And that was a really hard stage because he had so many things that were being required of him and so many, you know, um, blood pressure cuffs and, and thermometers and, you know, do this and do that. And the demands, I think, were cumulatively difficult. Um, so he would just try to refuse uh, lots of things. Uh, flight, you know, I mean, the easy thought is that they're going to try to run and, and get away. <laughs> but even just trying to avoid uh, lots of things is a flight response. And then um, my had kids like hide behind the exam tables mm -hmm. or like crawl under chairs. Yeah. And then freeze, like sometimes he would just zone out like, and you would think, oh, he's doing great. So sometimes some of these symptoms can seem like they're something else. And I think Megan's going to talk about that a little more too. So just some other ideas of general things about what to look like look for kids. So any times we see kind of basic, basic changes in kids, changes in eating and sleeping, that can be a sign that something can be going on. So that's something to kind of take a look at. And then thinking about it in context of their medical care and medical condition, there could be other reasons for that. But those are kind of some symptoms of when kids start to have mental health challenges. Sometimes we see changes in kind of those basic um, developmental tasks or things that we expect of kids. Other things to keep a look out for, increased irritability. Sometimes some of our kids in the hospital get misinterpreted as being really um, difficult or angry or oppositional when really they're afraid and scared and like they're snapping at people or they're yelling at people, you know, so kind of seeing some of those changes, if, you know, that's kind of out of characteristic for your child. We already talked a little bit about that with withdrawing, anger, frustrations. I mean, especially with some of the younger kids too, like the tantrums, if they're increasing or they're getting associated with you know, every time they walk in the clinic, we've had kids that um, we've had to help just even in the waiting rooms because they're kind of getting triggered even by coming into this space. Um, increased worries. If some of our kids or even teens sometimes, we'll even see some of our teenagers where their parents and them have to sleep in the same room. They just start to get too nervous. Now, as a family, if that's your choice and you want to do that, that's completely fine. But if it's more about fear-based, then that might be a sign of, of, of something that could be going on around all on for your child. I also want to say anytime you have any kind of self-harm thoughts or actions in your child, always take that seriously. Talk to your child's doctor um, and help to sort out um, what could be going on and, and if you need more help. Anytime you feel like you can't keep them safe, that's like an immediate trip to the emergency room so that you can kind of sort out what's going on and, and make sure that you have help keeping your child safe. So Melissa alluded to this a little bit before, thinking about what's similar to medical trauma. So things, we don't wanna just assume, oh, well, that's just medical traumatic stress in my child. This can be particularly hard to sort out um, if your child is nonverbal or really young. Um, things like pain can sometimes look like trauma with symptoms as well. Oppositional behavior can sometimes, it can be misinterpreted in both directions, a child can, either actually be being oppositional, we think it's trauma or the opposite. Um, anxiety, depression, sometimes those run along with me medical trauma too. So sometimes there's more than one thing going on. So some of the things um, that we look for is, you know, when did it start thinking about other times in your child's life? Like, have you seen your child in pain at other times? What are their signals? What are their symptoms? Melissa, do you have any examples of the pain or, or things that you no, you know, quite from your community around kind of that the nonverbal communication of some of these. What was difficult for us, and I think for other parents that I've I've dealt with in the rare disease and special needs community, is is mistaking or or confusion around the disease related symptoms and medical trauma because a lot I know my son's condition, similar ones have behavioral manifestations of their disease. So if they already can be hyperactive, um, or you know considered or, or characterized as defiant, it's really difficult to, to parse out what that is. And really, you know, some of what I did was to learn about some of these strategies and just start trying them because all of them are actually, and we'll get into those, are really helpful, even parenting strategies anyway, and are positive. So, um, you know, if you don't know, sometimes I'm like, well, I'm just going to start doing some of these really good things anyway. And, and hopefully, and they did help. 
So well, I think you were going to take this um, off about what does this look like in caregivers? Right. So this is, it's similar in caregivers as in children, but the great thing about us as caregivers is we can learn about it and hopefully recognize it in ourselves um, if we have it or recognize it in our child to help them. So a lot of similarities here. Um, you know, I think of it as like ruminating as an adult. I start think, oh, I should have done this and I should have done this and oh, this happened and, and you just can't get it out of your head. Um, you know, the telling the same stories um, about an experience at the hospital. And we have these wonderful patient friends and family that will listen to us, um, but that means we're really focusing on it. Or on the flip side, avoiding talking about it. Um, you know, we don't wanna talk about what happened that day or their disease. And, and some of that is normal in the sense of, you know, you can't think about really hard things all the time. Forgetting appointments is actually one because there's a subconscious thing. You don't really wanna deal with it or not making calls. I've done that myself where I just, I don't make the call for day after day because you really don't want to deal with it. Um, and then flight, flight or freeze um, in, in parents can look very different, obviously, than in kids. Um, you know, it, you know, fighting, you know, I think sometimes um, when I'm dealing with that, uh, or I know others are, you're kind of itching for a fight like a fight with the school, a fight with the insurance, a fight with the hospital. And that's really that kind of trauma reaction that you're having that, that you'll take any fight because, you know, you're dealing with these other things. A uh, flight is again, that kind of avoidance, um, just wanting to get it over with and get out. And, um, and that can actually, you know, make you feel worse in some ways and it can rush your child. And I've had to learn to really fight that and then freeze, um, you know, in, in adults, sometimes it can even look more like um, at the severe end dissociation where you just kind of zone out. And um, it can be also like a numbing, you know, we, sometimes we use, we'll talk about distraction as a strategy, um, use that to kind of numb out and just not deal with uh, what, we're, what we're feeling inside about um, our child and their condition or their medical care. Did I just go backwards? I think I did. Uh, no, you went for it. You know, go for it. Oh, did it. I? Oh, okay. Ah, sorry. See, no. I got control and there's issues. <laughs> no, keep going. Go again. Okay. Okay. Um, so this, this is one of my favorite quotes and we use it in the book. And, you know, this is being here, I feel like is the first step because educating ourselves as caregivers or clinicians enables us to do something about it. And, you know, you can start slow. You can, you know, this it may be overwhelming to hear lots of different strategies, but really choosing one makes a step, you know, going forward for you or your child. Um, so one thing, you know, as we talk about post-traumatic stress and medical traumatic stress and all the kind of the negative things that can, can kind of land when you have children with medical conditions, it can be really hard. The other thing that I always like to highlight too for families is for some families, um, they have this opportunity to have post-traumatic growth which is really where you see families making meaning out of the experiences that they've had together. Um, for some, this might be really treasuring the extra time that they had with their child in the hospital. Some families start foundations. Some families advocate at the school for changes to kind of take the stress and the challenge and like turn it into some kind of meaning. Um, so this is something that's kind of an opportunity to kind of grow from this experience that you can't control. And I will also say sometimes we see post-traumatic stress and those medical traumatic stress symptoms at the same time as growth. So they're not mutually exclusive. You can be way stressed out and also growing beautifully at the same time. Um, and then this framework, this is the framework that we present in the, in the book. So really thinking about as a caregiver or a parent of a child with a medical condition, you're really their coach. And there's like this um, kind of process that you can apply every time you see something kind of challenging in your child's care or in your child's reaction. So really thinking about getting all the information together, collecting the information, observing, seeing like what's going well, what's not going well, what's working, asking lots of questions of your medical team members, asking for more resources if you need them, choosing strategies, figuring out where are we gonna start? And like Melissa mentioned before, just pick one and try it, try to help your child. And then you can repeat, repeat the cycle again and see, did that work? Do we need to adjust it? And kind of where do we wanna go from there? And sometimes the coach strategy is great just as that little thing that can, you know, if you're feeling overwhelmed by a situation, that thing you can pull out of your brain and go, okay, what can I do here? 
this is what I can do. I can collect information. I can observe. I can ask questions. And then even that can move you out of, say, if you're in kind of a freeze mode in the hospital or dealing with something like that. So in the book, we go through uh, 12 different strategies. Um, some are very you know, specific and some are overall, and we'll, we'll kind of touch on a couple of those today just to give you place, a place to start from, uh, both for your child and for yourself. And I'll try to point out you know, areas that you know, might be better for you or your child or cognitively impaired child versus the teen. Um, so the first one is one of my favorites, um, medical play. And I think a lot of people do this without even realizing, you know, that this is a strategy or, or the reason why it just seems to fold into and, and hospitals thankfully encourage this often and child life uh, may give you supplies. So my son has a weekly infusion and he was really struggling with that. So we got ourselves sets of supplies, um, you know, safe supplies, and they were, they were real supplies in some cases, and then a medical kit. And we, you know, we started out just letting him play with them, free play, um, seeing what they're going to do. They may have some re-experiencing symptoms where they use these supplies to, to do these. Um, and, and then maybe it starts to get fun. Um, one of the things to focus on is a common language. Like, how do they think of their care? What do they call this procedure? What do they call this device? Uh, my son calls the needle that we use. He used to call it a one, two, three because the nurse would say one, two, three before she stuck him with the needle. And now he calls it a tube because it has a tube coming out. And anytime we see anyone in the, in the hospital or on a TV show, oh, they have a tube. Look at that. It's so normal. Um, so medical play is great, um, especially for young children or kids that are cognitively impaired. Uh, visual supports. Uh, this is a strategy, like I said, that is um, as a parent to a child with special needs myself, and even typical children, you know, we use task lists and, and a visual schedule is, is a pictorial representation of a series of events or a series of tasks for them to do. And the simple form is like a checklist, um, but there's a tactile form or, or an electronic form you can use on, a, on an iPad or a phone where they can move things over as they're completed. And or there you can use Velcro. Um, that's the old school analog way to move things with Velcro. A social story is is like a story, it, and it could be in a book form, or it could be about your child specifically. You know, their trip to my son has a sleep study next week. You know, Case's sleep study. Case arrives at the hotel. We get to ride the elevator. Case sees the room and he meets the tech. And, you know, it kind of goes through what's going to happen. So, it, you know, this, the visual schedule is like during the things as they're happening. And the social story is like a precursor um, to help prepare them. And then they can use it throughout that as well. Sometimes we um, include like a little stuffed toy or stuffed animal in the social stories and have them walk their stuffed toy through the appointments. For older kids, you can do more of like a checklist, like this is going to happen you can make a same like, this is, we're going to walk through this. You're going to listen to this music at this place. You're going to watch this show at this place. So you can still kind of map it out um, for older kids too. So we mentioned distraction and, you know, again, this is something also that is effective for kids that are very young or with cognitive impairment. You know, we as adults often use this um, by going on social media or things to, to kind of distract ourselves and zone out. The subtitle of this chapter, uh, if you're a parent of, of young or, or older kids, is Squirrel from the movie Up. Obviously, that's that's one of my son's favorite movies. And it just makes me think of, you know, you just that quick attention grabber that takes you away. So blowing bubbles or, you know, favorite songs, those, those are less quick. So their effectiveness might not last necessarily for a long time, especially for something that's painful. And, you know, there's, there's a balance here because there's pitfalls with distraction where they could be overstimulated. Um, you could get distracted and it's, it can be an avoidance strategy, which isn't as healthy as some other things. So you kind of have to balance. And, and sometimes you want to make sure that this is, you want to be proactive in your strategies. And sometimes this can tend to be towards a bribe. Uh, and, and so then, you know, that can have its own pitfalls as well. Now, this is my favorite strategy, actually, because it's a very holistic 
and um, you adapt the environment to to what will be more beneficial for for you and for your child. So you think ahead of time to a place or think now to a place that you have been, whether it's the hospital or a clinic, um, where there was a difficult appointment for, for your child. And, and we can even use this about ourselves. So you start to think about what were all my senses taking in in that time and what were what were things that were bothersome uh, that, that I was hearing in the hospital, the antiseptic smell, um, the hard floors, and then how can I replace um, or layer over some of those with some better options. So like hearing, can I listen to classical music on the way? Or for my child, can I listen to their favorite songs on the way? Um, sight, you know, do I have a favorite bracelet that I wanna wear? Um, that's also a touch thing and can be something tactile to use for our child. Bringing a book, um, you know, their iPad, their touch can be their favorite stuffy. You can wear your fuzzy sweater, um, you know, for taste, you bring chewy snacks as a distraction for kids sometimes if they're allowed to eat. Um, I always bring my favorite coffee that hits smell and taste. And, um, you know, that's that thing that makes you feel like home. This is also a great strategy for um, older kids, too, um, or kids, especially who are cognitively impaired, just making them feel more in their environment as much as possible. Another strategy that we don't have a slide for older kids um, is a reward system and um, or really for any kid, um, but can be effective for that as well. Um, now this one for parents or kids, you know, body control techniques, you know, this, this can be used, I say, either in an act in a reactive way or a proactive way. So you can use some of these strategies proactively to keep yourself calm. Or if you feel yourself going into like a fight or flight, using these to calm yourself down. Diaphragmatic breathing, um, this is a pictorial of it. You breathe in slowly for four seconds, um, you hold it for four seconds, and then you exhale for five. Exhaling longer is uh, better, it triggers something in your body, and then hold for four. Um, progressive muscle relaxation simply is just starting um, at your feet usually, and you tense up a set of muscles, and then you release them. And then you kind of go up your body doing that. So this is another great one for us as adults. You can do them in your chair. Other people don't necessarily know you're doing them to calm yourself down. Uh, and then, you know, for some of these, they may, they're, I can't use these necessarily with my son, uh, but kids at different levels might be able to do these. What I will say um, before we jump onto that one, like the, there's box breathing. We teach Dorito breathing. We smell the Dorito in. I don't know if I'm allowed to use that branded name, but we have kids kind of pick out like, how do you want to describe and get really creative with breathing? I've done Minecraft breathing. I've done butterfly breathing. I've done sparkly unicorn breathing. So just kind of figuring out what is their thing and then adapting the breathing and kind of describing it or have like the butterfly arms or like breathe in when you open, breathe out as you flap your wings. I've done octopus breathing with like big arms. And so just kind of thinking, you know, for your child or for yourself, kind of what brings that calmness. Okay. And I know, you know, we're trying not to talk too long here, but we're not going to get through this without talking about self-care at least for a, a, a half a second here. Um, I know a lot of caregivers, the last thing on our mind, but just trying to keep in mind, you know, often when we have kids with chronic medical conditions, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And so thinking about how do you care for yourself along the way and thinking about how can you creatively build it into your real life? Because lots of people, maybe you can't do respite care if you can't leave for vacation for a week, but like, can you, you know, step out of the room and take 10 deep breaths? Can you journal? Can you have a book that you like to read it while you're waiting for your child? So just being really creative and just trying something and jumping right in and starting. And I think if I can jump in here too, for, you know, depending on who your support system is in your life, and we talk about this in the book a lot about identifying your support system and, and having your team, you know, there are sometimes where either it can feel to us or others can represent that self-care is selfish. Um, and, you know, we may not even be calling it self-care. It's that I need to go get my nails done or, you know, I just want to walk the grocery store for 30 minutes by myself. You know, we may not identify or have the language to say that is self-care, but it is. And I'm here to tell you, it is not selfish. Um, it is something to care for yourself 
and, and not some people say it's care for yourself so you can care for your child. No, caring for yourself because you are worthy of care. Beautiful, Melissa. I love it. Um, thinking a little bit too about when to get more help for either your child or yourself. Um, so we always say like if your child or your own emotions are getting in the way of what your child needs to do for their medical care or for school or for work, like those are times to reach out um, to get more support for yourself just if you want more support for your child. So, you know, there's no magic reason that like, oh, I've got this. Sometimes we've got it. And sometimes we could just use some more help or if you have a specific goal for your child that you can't figure out exactly how to get there. Sometimes you can get help for yourself, even without your child about specific parenting strategies. If you're struggling with something for your child, again, any self-harm, harm to other thoughts, um, definitely that's a time to reach out and get help. The other time I will say is sometimes, particularly as caregivers, we're really good it's shoving our own needs aside. And this kind of goes along with the self-care and being like, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. But if you're hearing from other people, oh, you seem a little bit off. Are you okay? You know, if you start to kind of hear that, paying attention to others' concerns well and reaching out for more help. There's really good evidence-based therapy that can really help kids and parents and siblings and families alike um, kind of navigate the medical journey. Where to start with that, um, talk to your primary care doctor, your pediatrician, your child's medical team. Sometimes it's helpful to look at your insurance company list and kind of see who is covered. And then it can be a lot of calling. And so I know that can be a little overwhelming too, but seeing if you can find a provider that has experience with medical conditions, see if you can find somebody that uses evidence-based therapy. If you're looking for somebody for your child, making sure that there's somebody who treats children, um, even if they don't have the medical experience, that can still be helpful. There are some online platforms that allow like text-based support or virtual appointments. So if you're in the hospital all the time or you're at lots of medical appointments, some people even have like texting plans so you can get support that way. School counselors can be a great starting point. And then the emergency room, you know, for anything urgent, any safety concerns, that's a, that's a good place to start. There's also the mental health crisis line. I don't know if everyone's aware of that yet. And they just um, launched it, I believe it was this year. So kind of like the, the 911 is for our physical health emergency is 988 is, you know, for in a mental health crisis that needs support, you can text or call it to get some support. If there's an urgent safety concern or you need transport to a hospital though, you still go with 911. And then that brings us, there's a, an, uh, you know, a little picture of our very fun book that Melissa and I wrote all around having a lot more information about some of the things we talked about today um, for how to kind of manage medical care and how parents can champion and caregivers can champion for their kids and for themselves to kind of navigate the medical journey. Thank you so much, Melissa and Megan. Um, before we open up the room in the chat for questions from everyone, I have a couple of follow-up questions for you. Um, first, I want to say that when I think about strategies for kids, sometimes it's not so obvious how that would be helpful. It's just we suggest a parent does this. Um, but the social story one in particular comes to mind because I realize I have a social story for myself every single day. It's called a calendar. And it outlines exactly what is going to happen for me that day. And sometimes I plan like, okay, so I'll be able to grab a snack between that and that 10 minute block before two meetings. And it really helps the overwhelm of the day feel so much more manageable because I'm like ticking things off. And so I find for me, I think about the parallel adult version of the child version intervention that you suggested is a really useful way to see um, or understand how that could be useful for for someone. Um, love that. I love that. I have a social story for myself and it's called a calendar. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I do have a question. So you mentioned the reward charts. Um, I get asked a lot, my background is in pediatric oncology. So I worked with a lot of families in the hospital myself and um, needle pokes, needle sticks, whatever you call them, shots is a big question. And it's not just a hospital thing. It's just a pediatrician thing too. Um, can you give a, a quick overview about what a behavior plan, a reward chart might look like for needles? Sure. So I think for needle sticks, one thing that I like to pair with the behavior chart and like the reinforcements and the rewards is a really specific plan about how it's going to go. So again, kind of making that stepwise list. 
and outlining for your child what's expected at every step of the way. So for some kids who start worrying about needle sticks, you know, three days ahead, a week ahead, that might look different than some kids that just worry about it right before. So making sure that you have like the criteria, like the, the rules of when do they earn their reward. So often when we start working with kids that have really big needle fears, we lay out the rules of like, is it okay to cry? Yep, you can cry. Is it okay to scream? Maybe, depending on the kid, screaming might be okay. Is it okay to kick the nurses? Nope, no kicking. Is it okay to swear at your parents or swear at the medical team? No. Are you going to threaten to kill somebody? No. So you kind of adapt it to, and I say that kind of in just, but some of our kids, if a needle has become trauma and your body is reacting as if you are getting attacked, sometimes some of those things do come out. You know, kids are screaming and crying and threatening and kicking and you know, all the things. Um, so really thinking about identifying the reward ahead of time. If your child is able to participate in choosing what should that reward be, identify if you want it like on a point system or a single reward. Like, do they have to earn, you know, three points by walking into the doctor's office without fighting, walking back to the waiting room, sitting, you know, sitting there. For some of our kids, they even get the reward if they're held because they still need help being held, but they don't fight or scream. So kind of really adapting it. And then what we do over time is you increase expectations over time with the goal of we want the kid to get the reward and we want the needle stick to be done successfully with as little kind of drama and trauma as possible. Thank you. And I think um, it's important also, you mentioned uh, the, the crying is okay, for example. And so it's important to distinguish that it's a behavior that you're modifying, not the feelings about what's going on, yeah. right? So yeah. no one's being reinforcing it's okay to be scared. I think one of the things that sometimes happens with adults is, especially I'll see this a lot with court access, they well, it's not supposed to hurt. It doesn't hurt. But for the child, if they perceive that it hurts, then we just, you know, we say, okay, like we're not going to argue about whether something hurts or not. What the thing that we are able to change is, you know, their, their behaviors and work with their behaviors. We don't, we're not going to change the way they feel necessarily right away. Hopefully that comes over time. Um, but yeah. So this is related to that. If you have a child who just absolutely hates going to the hospital or the outpatient clinic or the dentist for that matter, um, is it, would you recommend the same type of reward plan or are you, is there a different strategy that you might consider? Um, I think so with, I think it depends on kind of how long is it gonna take? What is required? What, you know, kind of, so kind of adapting everything you can, so, so for some kids, we've done like create a special art project that you only work out at, at the doctor's office or a special toy that you only get to play in the hospital. Pack a special bag with all your favorite things. Um, some things there might be rewards. I think often it's helpful, especially with younger kids or kids that are at a, like um, a younger developmental level to have small rewards rather than do everything great and you get to go to Disneyland, you know, but like more of the, We've had, I've had some families promise some pretty substantial rewards for some things that I'm like, I would love those rewards. Can I behave that well? Um, but making sure when you choose the reward, it fits for your family. I mean, if you can afford that and that's your family, you know, that's great. But like making sure that you choose something that fits for your family and doing kind of smaller, more frequent awards rather than a like one or nothing. Um, so they can lose some of the reward, but still gain some of the reward as well. Most yeah, we actually did that. Not. We, uh, when we would go to North Carolina for his clinical trial trip every month, I would have a theme to the rewards. And so there was a toy story theme. And so they were different, um, of the Lego toy story, like chunky Lego people and, um, Duplo, I guess. And so they, um, he would see them all at the beginning and then he would know that he would get to pick one. So he would keep seeing all the ones that he was going to get over time and then they would get to pick one. So then we got through cognitive testing, we got through the anesthesia events, we got through the appointments and by the end he had all six characters from his little set. That's really creative, Melissa. I love that with the themes. Um, I have a few more questions to ask, but I'm also just want to open the, the chat and I hope that anyone attending um, you know, if you have a question, oh, actually one just popped in here. So um, 
please go ahead and start entering those and, and we'll reference them the best that we can. Um, so, so the first question, Megan and Melissa, that's coming in the chat is someone asking about a resource for an uh, older teen um, whose anxiety interferes with their own planning for appointments and or explaining the symptoms they need to communicate during the appointments. This is an 18 year old who had many surgeries as a young child. Um, and now it's almost a vis as if his anxiety from those years prevents him from self advocating. This is a great question and this applies to us as caregivers who experience stress and anxiety as a child and still have trouble going to medical appointments right like these things that happened earlier in life and how that affects our interactions with the medical system over time at different stages of development. I think you know the first thing that comes to mind for me and, and like I said there are more strategies in the book than what we had time to present on on slides we want to give some kind of quick wins um, ideas but one of the ones you know that we talk about is communication and that may seem really obvious but especially with with a child if they're verbal and they can kind of think through what might be happening to them you know really having a layered um, progression of communication so, you know, one of the things I mentioned with, with smaller children or cogn cognitively impaired is having a common language for what's happening. So that can, that same kind of challenge can exist in teens or a kid that's 18 that really doesn't necessarily have the language to put around what has been happening to them. And sometimes that can come through therapy, um, but it can also, you know, come through discussions with a parent who is starting to learn more about this and just can you know, start that process to communicate. Yeah, so I think with some of our older teens, um, if we've identified some, that a patient's either having trouble kind of understanding everything that's going on or has anxiety that's kind of interfering with their ability to communicate, we'll, we'll have them, we'll identify a medical provider and a parent can certainly ask for this and have a medical provider spend 10 minutes at every appointment talking and reviewing, this is what your diagnosis is you know, here are your medications. Do you have any questions about these medications? And breaking it up into small pieces and having the medical provider actually lead, but, but give space for the teenager. Another thing that we've done with, with older teens is have them write down their questions ahead of time. Um, and so, and like create like a, a notebook so that they can come in. And if they can't verbalize them, I've had some teens that hand the notebook to their medical providers. So they're starting to learn how to do that even if they can't verbalize the questions that they might have. I think other things that can be helpful, and I think Melissa alluded to this, is just having, you know, casual conversations about medical stuff in the house, or maybe sharing about um, other medical things that might be going on in the family in kind of a casual way to make it more kind of normative to talk about. I do think if there's a goal for a young adult or, or an older teen that they wanna take on advocacy in their um, medical care and they're really um, frozen up, it's a great time to pursue some therapy to have somebody coach them and learn specific strategies that would help them overcome kind of what their specific barriers are. Yeah, I know some caregivers that I've talked with that you know when they start to learn about medical trauma and their child, and then start to realize it's in themselves. And then they hearken back to medical experiences that they've had as a child. So we carry, until we really deal with any kind of trauma really, and, and resolve it and find strategies to, to work through it, we carry it with us in you know, our reactions, we carry it with us in our bodies. And so, you know, sometimes, as Megan said, dealing with a, a medical trauma can, can bring into, you know, into play other traumas. And so as caregivers, um, you know, being educated and, and helping your child and yourself can only benefit you both. And educating your child, like this is what is labeling it, not being afraid to call it what it is and having open conversations in the family can help also destigmatize some of those fears and those, those feelings too. I'm going to just keep going in order of the chat to keep myself organized here. The next question is about how do we get this sort of education about trauma into medical training programs? Um, and this question, writer has also um, suggested a resource about this, but um, do you have thoughts about that? And I think Megan, you're, you're certainly involved in some sort of 
We are. Um, so at our institution, we um, provide training for all of our medical residents that come through on trauma-informed care and how to recognize signs and symptoms. Um, I also am um, um, an associate director at the Center for Pediatric Traumatic Stress. And if you look at, maybe we can add this to the resources that we share, Chrissy, um, um, healthcaretoolbox.org has free trainings for medical providers on medical trauma. Um, there's some free CEs for nurses there. And um, there's free handouts that medical providers can learn kind of what signs and symptoms are and learn some of the challenges that families have and provide handouts to families that they work with as well. Um, we're make, we actually in that same, um, with that same group, we recently created a curriculum for nursing students um, that can be deployed in, within nursing programs and nursing schools to help educate our nurses about medical trauma. Um, and then we're working on more resources for like the, the medical education too. Um, we also do train and retrain our, um, not just our trainees, but our, our, um, our attendings and people um, to kind of try to keep it top of mind and work on that, that culture shift. As and well. I think for families too, and for parents that are on here that are advocates, um, you know, I personally am involved with the parent and family advisory council at my local teaching hospital here in Nashville. And so that may be something to look into um, if you're near a larger hospital, especially a teaching hospital, um, they may have a parent and family advisory council. And that's one of the things I know we talk about is how uh, is trauma already incorporated and how can we better incorporate it into the medical education? And, and if you are a parent advocate, um, recommending to the to your medical institution to integrate it into grand rounds, that's a place that many medical providers that gets attention. Um, so if you recommend they, you know, bring in speakers or if they have in-house speakers that can talk about it in grand rounds, that could be a, a powerful place. Um, the next question asks, do you have any suggestions for language or a framework to use with a young child regarding body consent or permission versus necessary medical intervention that they don't have control over? So one of the things we always talk about our medical providers with is um, talking about um, with kids only give choices where there are choices and preventing, presenting it really matter of fact. So with young children providing the education and if it's something that is kind of invasive or uncomfortable, say in like, you know, I know like our, some of our pediatricians say, I have to examine this part of your body. I'm only going to do that when your parents are in the room. And that's okay because this is the medical procedure and we have to do it this way. Um, or just preparing them of like, this is what's going to happen. This is not a choice. This is part of your medical care. Like just being really upfront and really clear about it. And then also sit and, and being really up, upfront with other education of if you're teaching about, you know, um, any kind of abuse concerns or if it's a child that's had abuse in the past and saying, yep, that's not okay. This is okay. And just being really upfront and clear about it and having kind of multiple discussions as kids get older about that. I'm going to ask a question that was, um, before I get to the others in the chat, that was submitted to us via email. Um, it, it came from a parent who was asking about the use of medication to help with trauma symptoms. Um, so for example, they, they raised the issue of ketamine, but there are other medications for anxiety that are sometimes paired before procedures, during procedures, after procedures. Can you comment on that, like the utility think, of medication? I think it's important to realize that, you know, there are, it's such a broad array of things that influence our, our children and ourselves way before we get to the hospital or get to a place where medication could, could even be administered. So, I mean, that's, but also, you know, there's other medications, obviously, that we haven't talked about related to anxiety and things like that. But um, speaking specifically to that question, um, really looking at the strategies like adapting the environment and all the things that lead up to that point. But when once you get to that point, yes, there are, my son had a pre-procedure protocol of medications that we used um, that did help, but we also had to deal with everything um, that was leading up to that. So, you know, we're not in the car and gosh, we turned left and he knows that goes to the hospital and that's already starting that process. Yeah, I think times that I always suggest for families to talk to their docs or their medical team, if the kind of 
emotional or physical body reactions are beyond what the child can use. Like they can't use their skills because they're so escalated or so elevated that they can't use breathing. They can't calm their bodies down. They seem completely out of control. That's a time to partner with your medical team to say, hey, are there any other interventions? And sometimes what we can do is sometimes we use medications in conjunction with some of the strategies, like Melissa said, for short term. And then the kids learn the strategies really well and then they don't need the medications anymore. Other times there's kids' bodies that they just, they do need extra support and medications and we're all wired different ways. And so really talking through that with your medical provider and considering your child's unique medical experience and everything they've got going on to see if that's an option. Thank you. And there's a, another li- a resource that's been listed in the chat uh, with the website listed there. There's a question about, are there any specific roles that fathers can play Um, And this writer comments that they notice mostly mothers on this call, including the panel today. Yeah, and I think that's, it's, it is common. I mean, we see that in the rare disease community. We see that on the advisory council that I am on that we actively sought, uh, you know, father participation. And there's so many dynamics, um, social, socioeconomic, just traditional and generals that that have played into that. But I think, you know, fathers can do the exact same things. And I've seen some incredible uh, dads of kids in our community just step into those roles, learn these strategies, and they can, you know, they're interchangeable with with the mom and they just step in and weave in and out, uh, you know, deploying these to help their kids. I know for some families, um, you know, whether it's a mother, father, 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 mother, mother, grandma, mother, like kind of single mom, kind of picking out like who, who can kind of handle what the best. So in some situations, one of the parents is super anxious about a certain thing and the other parent is able to stay more calm in the room. And so I've had some families, they always send the dad because for the mom, it's too anxiety provoking. And then vice versa. I have had some where the dad is clearly invested and, and definitely wants to be involved, but can't be in the room for certain things. Um, And so really thinking about in your family system, what is each of your strengths? And then like building on those strengths to support your child. And then also if you have whatever your family system is supporting each other. Thank you. And I mean, as we're getting close to the top of the hour, but I'm just going to finish up with one or two more questions and I'll comment. There's another uh, resource here listed in the chat. Um, And then Ashley writes that she has a son who is three with Down syndrome. And I think what she's described is that they've tried quite a few of the interventions that you described today. Um, I'm sorry for summarizing so briefly, but I, I think that's the gist here. So what, what happens when you've implemented a lot of these strategies and the challenges still continue? So I think those are times, and I'm guessing that Probably if you're implementing lots of strategies, you probably are partnering with medical team members. You probably are seeking out additional support. But if you've kind of tried, you know, kind of the typical strategies, it can be really helpful to find a mental health provider, a behavioral health provider, or a really invested medical team member that can help you kind of walk through each place of it and see, is there anything you can modify just a little bit for your child here or there? Um, Figuring out and stepping back and sometimes thinking about what has worked in other situations. Is there any way to adapt, you know, that to a medical situation? Um, But I think, you know, if you've tried everything and it feels like you've tried everything, that's definitely a time to kind of reach out and try to connect to get more support. And I'll add not just for for the child or for the process of supporting your child, but for you as a parent. Yeah. The, the, The case is, is that we all do what we can as parents and our children are still going to struggle sometimes, right? Like it, Mm -hmm. and and that is not an easy thing to face. And I think getting support for yourself as a parent, when you're going through this journey with your child um, is so important. 